Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. This is One Child to Be a Survivor to Another um, Restoration. It's just a show that I put together recently just to sort of talk about my healing journey, the culmination of of a few years' worth of work um, dealing with uh, being abused as a child and then working through all the different aspects of it. And so hopefully this uh, show will, you know, help someone out there who's who's struggling and having a hard time and not, you know, not sure what to do next sort of thing. You know, I mean, my healing journey was was exactly that. It, you know, it was my healing journey. I mean, all of us are different. We all need different things. We all experience different things and we're, we're all different, right? So what worked for me may not work for somebody else and what worked for somebody else may not work for me and that's for sure. I I used to say that on all my shows, um, One Child to Be a Survivor to another through like 2010, uh, 2011, whatnot. So you have to listen to all my shows at your own discretion because I'm talking about abuse and it's a very sensitive subject and it's a subject that a lot of people just feel um, uh you know, it's it's hard to listen to, right? And survivors, you know, it can trigger survivors. And so that's why it's really important that uh, everybody listen at your own discretion and make sure that you're okay to listen to my shows, right? Especially dealing with child abuse, right? So we left off sort of talking about um, some books that I found very helpful and some um, some people that I found very helpful. And that was John Bradshaw's work and um, Robert Burney, B B U R N E Y Burney. And he wrote uh, a great book, and also um, John Bradshaw, their book dealing with, uh, a lot of it was dealing with the inner child and inner child work. And I found that very helpful. When I first started looking at the inner child material, I really didn't think that it would be applicable to me because I didn't, I wasn't thinking that I necessarily had inner children, uh, you know, that I needed to to have, have something done to help them out I, but I knew that there was something inside of me or some some part of me that was still um, stuck back in in the, with the memories of the abuse and the, the trauma and the flashbacks and whatnot. I could see myself at these different ages just in my own memories um, with the, the trauma I was experiencing and I knew that at these stages in my life I, when I was young, I, I didn't get any help, and so I knew that these were still wounded parts of myself that were in there that were causing me a lot of grief as an adult, you know, who was functioning quite well in the world and doing okay. Um, but I still had all of these inner, inner, in, inward stuff going on, and a lot of it was spiritual, but but a lot of it was um, just due to the the trauma of the abuse. And so um, looking at Robert Burney's material and looking at John Bradshaw was very helpful. I, I actually bought two two of John Bradshaw's books and I didn't have a whole lot of money to work with and I actually got a gift certificate. Somebody gave me a gift certificate for a, a bookstore and I went to the bookstore and I got um, two of John Bradshaw's books and then a friend of mine sent me, I actually purchased Robert Burney's book for me and actually sent it to me. So that was very cool. Um, and I read those books and I just worked through them as I was reading them and it was very, very helpful. Uh, looking also at a couple of websites that were out there talking about the inner child and inner child work. And I also had joined a, at that time, this was back in 2010, and I joined a an online support group that was geared for survivors of abuse and it was it had a lot to do with inner children inner child um so you could you know in this in this uh group you could be anonymous and you could um work through and have these um uh, sort of like i guess uh I don't know what you want to call them but these figures that would save you right these figures it could be imaginary figures. They could be superheroes. They could be uh, anything that, that that came to a person's mind that that they felt would be the ultimate, most powerful uh, person or being in existence that could that could come and rescue us. Because abused children, I mean, quite often are not rescued. You know, I mean, some are, and that's great and that's wonderful. Thank God. 
and I, they all need to be. Um, you know, the, the rest of us who've been dealing with this as survivors of abuse know that not all of us were rescued out of these situations. And so what they suggest and what they what certain groups suggest and certain websites and certain people suggest that we can go through and we can do this inner child work and help ourselves to to actually rescue ourselves, you know. And I found that a lot of the, I, I thought it was a weird concept at first because I'm a Christian and I just couldn't get into these other alter egos like these other personalities like uh, Superman or something or Superwoman coming to save me. But for me, it was God. And so I just envisioned it was God and his holy angels coming to, to rescue me, right? And so that, that was very helpful. But what really made a huge difference, and I have to say, like I did a show with her on here, uh, Beverly Searle, she's got a, actually she put together a program with some other um, therapists, and, and um, I don't know if they're all psychotherapists, but there's, they're definitely therapists, cl- clinicians. And they put together a, a program called Forget Talking Therapy. And I guess it, it's not, like she was saying on, on the show, she actually, Beverly sort of came on the show, and she's the founder, really, the creator of it. She said it wasn't that she was trying to say, oh, it's, it's, talking therapy is no good, because I actually argued with her on that and said that talking therapy was very helpful for me. But, and, and who knows about somebody else, but I know for me it was very helpful. And she said, no, she wasn't trying to say, just forget about it, but what she was saying was that what really works is pictures, because the limbic system in the brain, it, it, it only processes pictures. And that's the, that's the part of the brain that when a person or a child is abused, that's where the trauma is stored. It's in the pictures in the mind. And that's, of course, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's the flashbacks. It's the real uh, terror and trauma kind of recurring and, and re-haunting and because it's these memories, these traumatic memories. It's all in the limbic system and it's all pictures, right? And so it doesn't communicate by words so much. And so she was going through talking about that. It's really quite interesting, and you can get her stuff. Um, she's in Australia, but you can go on her website, Forget Talking Therapy, and check it out. And um, she did a session with me, actually, after the show. And a friend of hers, who's also one of the sort of, the, I guess you want to say, uh, assistant creators or helped her out on the project, uh, is a good friend of mine. And she lives in Australia as well. And she was working on part of the program with me, the first eight steps. But Beverly Searle took me through the last steps, the last portion of the steps after uh, the show that night. Stayed on the phone with me. And it was, uh, I would say, it it truly made 98% of the difference in my healing journey. And I think what it was is, just like she said, it's all pictures in the mind. And so for me, you know, I mean, she has a whole step-by-step process of how you do this and you have to set this, this safe place up in your up in your higher conscious in your being, in your, in your mind, in your thought process. And this is where your inner children will be safely taken to, right? But for me, I couldn't get away from anything aside from Christianity because I'm a Christian. So I, I created a place that... God's angels were protecting, and it was, you know, it, it, it really based on Christianity for me because that's real to me, and that's real for me. And so I couldn't get into any kind of other thing. But I know lots of people. I, I actually was on that um, in that support group, like I was saying, uh, for people who had been abused, who really based on inner child work. And there was lots of people who had all kinds of different. Um, all types of different, uh, all, like like superpowers that would come in and save them. And for them, you know, they were quite uh, open about the fact that it was working for them. So there is something to that whole inner child thing. And I know for me, I mean, at first I was very skeptical and very much um, not really even interested in trying to do the work on it. But as I started to go through it and, and started to work and you know, allow myself to, to go through the process of it, it actually made a huge difference and I mean today I can sit here I don't have at all the same problems and the same issues of flashbacks the same uh, recurring kind of uh, uh, morose depression type thing coming around me anymore and it's and I have and it's all natural I haven't done any 
kind of prescription or haven't had any kind of other therapy or, or uh, professional clinical therapy or anything like that. It was just going through and doing the work, but I was able to do it on my own, which some people, I mean, it's, I mean, it's true and it's sad that, you know, there's so many people out there, I know lots of them, who cannot do the work on their own. And so they need to have, they need to be in a safe place and they need to have somebody with them who can make sure that they're safe and keep them safe. And that's what you should do if that's what you need. I would never suggest, like I said on my last show, and I said on just about all of my shows dealing with with, uh, with um, healing and, and the healing process, you have to be really sure if you're going to try to attempt this stuff on your own. Like I knew that I was going to be able to do this work and not hurt myself. And so, or hurt somebody else, or, you know, or fall into a serious depression or anything like that. Like I knew I'd be all right to do the work and I was confident and so I, I didn't have a problem doing it. But for so many people, and I know so many, I have many survivor friends who who cannot attempt this type of thing on their own, and there's no shame in that. That's not, there's no, um, you know, it's not to say there's no slight against it at all, you know. I mean, we all are different. We've all been through different things. We all need some, we all need different help, really. That's why this is such a huge issue, you know. It's hard to find. You just got to keep looking for what works for you and what, what, seems to help and then you know what doesn't seem to help then just don't worry about that don't move on to something else that might help you know i mean i I know lots of people that do um art therapy and that works for them they're they have huge uh progress made through their art and um it's wonderful i know lots of people who journal lots of survivors of abuse who journal and journaling, I I did that. And that's what really basically started my healing journey was journaling. I needed to do it, and I I just started doing it. I was like, okay, I'm doing it. I'm not holding back. I'm I'm journaling whatever I need to say is coming out, and um, that was very helpful. And there's all kinds of things that a person can do, but you just have to find what works for you, and and then um, and then roll with it. And allow it to to help. You know, this is. Um, it took me a, years to get where I am today. Like it wasn't an overnight process. It took take me a lot of hard work. And um, in uh, you know, I was lucky because well, I guess we would say lucky, but um, blessed or whatever you want to say. I was just able to hold down a job at the same time. It was actually probably good for me that I was doing that because I was able to to go out into the world, do my normal thing, work, you know run errands, go to the grocery store, and then come home and do the work. So I wasn't constantly thinking about it. And I was able to take part of the day off and just do normal adult things and then spend a portion of my evening or a portion of my morning working on it. Mainly I was doing a lot of the... I was doing my shows in the morning and I was doing the work um, at night before I would go to bed, doing lots of reading and stuff. And it was very helpful. So uh, it was a process that took a long time, though. It certainly didn't happen overnight. And I mean, I know because of what I've been doing, I mean, I've met so many survivors and I know so many survivors of abuse who, I mean, you know, they've been suffering along and and actually managing quite well, but been dealing with this for years, years and years. And I, I know myself, like, I mean, I didn't even start dealing with this until I was 42. I didn't start dealing with my, with my issues, um, at all survivor issues until I was 42, and so you know it's like it's like going to be six years later. So six years it's taken me really six years to get where I am today. Obviously, just daily, day by day. But I mean, I can say honestly, like I'm sitting here in so much of a better place, even though there's a lot more uh, stuff going on in my life that could, could cause a lot of issues and a lot of trauma. My husband is terminally ill and he's sick and um, you know, we just go day by day, right? And so, but I just just keep going, you know, that's what you have to do. But in my healing journey, I don't have the same, um, it doesn't haunt me like it used to. And I tell you, I don't know, I mean, at one point I was just like, wow, I actually feel better, better than I've ever felt in my entire life about my past and about my, about my situation, it doesn't mean that the that the that, that I forgot or for you know or, uh, that I'm forgetting what happened to me. Actually, that's not true at all. It, that didn't 
change, and I, I don't know if that ever changes for most people. Um, I think what it is is, is just it's just the pain just it just doesn't hurt as much. I still know what happened to me, and I'm still dealing with a lot of the the, the physical problems because of it, and uh, even probably some self sabotaging as far as relationships go. But um, I'm still working on some of that stuff. But I don't have the same um, times of darkness and the times of of real uh, despair and real getting down to the very bottom of 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 the pit and just staying in this pity party, I guess, whatever you want to call it, uh, for days and days, just not able to pull myself out of it and then go to work, come home, back in the pity party, go to work, come home, back in the pity party, like pits of depression, mainly is what it was, but I don't go there anymore. I don't need to go there anymore. I still have uh, tears every now and then. I still have a little bit of anger, but you know what? That's healthy. You know, we have to be able to feel Right, I mean, we don't want to close off every single feeling that we have just be, because we don't want to feel the other stuff that's bad. It's just no good, right? But I think it's important to allow ourselves to feel. But we have to be able to control. And that's where, for, when I was 42 years old, that's what I was not able to do, was control my, control the, uh, whatever you want to call it, the rage, the anger, the the hurt, Um and the despair and the sadness and it was all just way too much and it was just overwhelming and I, I you know I've been doing it for years I've been dealing with that and I just wasn't sure how, how many more years I could keep doing it you know um, and now I don't have that same problem and I think it's because I literally day by day took the time to go through and face this stuff <laughs> and it was hard and I didn't. I had the listening audience here. It was basically my silent counselor. You know, um, some counseling and therapy is just the therapist sits on the other side of the desk and just sits there and just listens to you and doesn't say anything unless you talk and doesn't have any input unless you figure it out. They get paid a lot of money to do that. I just decided to come on Blog Talk Radio and allow my listening audience to be that for me because I needed to get this stuff out. <laughs> And there wasn't anybody that was going to listen to me for that, for that many days about this stuff and for that many years. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to just say what I need to say, deal with what i got to deal with. And it, it certain, certainly did help. I also wrote a lot. I wrote poetry. I wrote books. I wrote blogs, really. started out writing a blog uh, that, that became my book, A Life of Death Redemption. But it was a blog called um, uh, Not So Fond Memories Growing Up in an Abusive Home. It was a public-facing blog, and I just took the blog and didn't change it much. There's a few words changed in there by the editor that felt that it should be just changed a little bit, a few words here and there, but the, the actual blog is, is actually the book. And so I was, that was very helpful because I was like, aha, my abusers are not going to get away with this. But see, not everybody's in the same position. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody can, can uh, literally come out and point the finger publicly at their abusers um, because of fear of retribution and fear of of, of ostrac- being ostracized from the family. I was already ostracized. I mean, our family was abusive, right? There was no family in the first place, so who? I wasn't worried about being ostracized out of the family. I mean, there is no family. So I mean, that wasn't an issue. But it, some people can't, uh, can't do that for many reasons. Their life is maybe in jeopardy. You know, they may fear for their life if they come out and point out who their abuser was, whether it was family or not. And so, you know, in that respect, I feel very blessed to be able to do that, and that's why I did it, because I thought there's so many survivors out here who will never, ever be able to voice what happened to them and never, ever be able to allow the, anyone to know what happened to them or or to be able to even publicly say what happened to them. And, and, and many won't because of the just the, the shame and the, and the fear associated with it. And, I mean... Uh, when I, I mean, I never really had that many friends uh, in my lifetime anyway, but I've always had a few good friends. And when I did come out publicly with my abuse and start talking about it, I actually lost a lot of people who were, who I thought were my friends. Um, which And it's really interesting to see how they all sort of scurried off. And I found out they weren't really my friends in the first place. So it did show me who my true friends were. And it did show me that I have... Um, 
the right to speak out against what happened to me and it really empowered me so i think that was also part of that the, the healing journey you know was just it, it really empowered me to say you know what no what what happened to, to me personally and what happened to my family was not right to my siblings to my mother um even though my mother was my main abuser i mean it just um i still knew what she had gone through dealing with my dad. I mean, I was witnessing it firsthand. And also just her own childhood. Right? So, I mean, she was a victim. She was also an abuser, but she was a victim first. And so, you know, I knew this stuff wasn't right. And I thought, you know, I have a right to speak out against this. I have a right. And it's my priority. And my I mean, It's my prerogative. And I can do this if I want to. And I decided that uh, it didn't matter to me if people... Um, who I thought were my friends didn't want to have anything to do with me um, because it showed me truly who my real friends were and who who was who was just a uh, a good time party friend. Just when things were going good, you know, I, I had a lot of those people in my life who I thought were my real friends, and they are gone. You know, I mean, and also because my husband is terminally ill, nobody wants to hang around with anybody who's got a terminally ill family member. Let me tell you that <laughs> it's very. Very rare that you will find somebody who will stick around and be by your side when you have somebody in your life who's terminally ill uh, because they don't want to have to deal with your tears. It's the same with being abused. It's the same thing. They don't want to have to deal with a survivor's uh, life. They only want to be around people who are having good times and people who have, who have nothing to think about what color they're going to paint their toenails. I always bring that up, but that's because, to me, that's just so shallow. It's like, who cares about what color people's toenails are? I really don't care. Um, it's like, you know, that's just shallow thinking, and sh- to me, it's just shallowness. Like, if a person wants to paint their toenails, fine, but that's not the most important thing in this world. And right now, there's people dying in, in need of dire help and sincere people to be around them, and they're not concerned about toenails. And so I always kind of bring that up. But the thing is, is, I mean, yeah, what do you do? You know, there's just so many people in the world who have these issues going on in their life. You know, they're suffering, they're struggling, whether they've been abused or whether they're just just having hard times. Um, you know, people who are dying of cancer, there's people all over the place that they're really suffering. And it's hard to find people that will stand by, stand by that and stand by you. So if you have a good friend, you know, that's wonderful. And if you don't, don't give up. Just keep reaching out. Keep looking for that help where you can find it. Keep looking for that hope where you can find it. Um, that's my big message is do not give up. You know, it's it's not, to me it's just not an option because in the back of, we, 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 I talk about it on all of my shows, but I mean most of my shows have something to do with suicide, but that's because suicide was was put on us as children. My parents were always talking about suicide. And my dad was always trying to commit suicide. It wasn't every day, but he was probably on a weekly or biweekly basis trying to kill himself. And one time he even tried to kill my sister and myself by driving us over a cliff with him in the car. And so he he was suicidal, and he was also talking about suicide all the time. And my mother was always talking about suicide too. So... When we grew up, we just heard this, that we should all commit suicide. This was drilled into our heads, that, that we were worthless, that um, we shouldn't be here, we didn't belong here, and that we should all be dead. And that, and you know, if my parents weren't saying they were going to kill us, then they were threatening suicide. And they were threatening, you know, uh, what do you call that, family side, where they kill the family and then kill themselves. Um, so my brothers, it was just nothing for them to kill themselves. I was on the same road. My sister was actually going to kill herself one time. She had a gun, too. She always carried it. She packed a gun. And she, her and her husband packed a gun. And um, she died of cancer a a few years ago. And um, she, you know, at one point was going to kill herself. We were worried about that. So not everybody in my family was going to commit suicide. But there were quite a few of us that used to think about it a lot. Two of my brothers killed themselves. And, um... They, they lost because they let my parents win that fight. They let the abuse win. Like they let. To me, it's just like 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 giving up. It's like uh, saying, "Yeah, okay, you got the victory." It's like, no, we can't do that. 
like for me, the fight was to stay alive. It's like, no, I'm I'm staying. I'm staying whether anybody on this planet likes it or not. <laughs> I'm staying. You know, I mean, because when I grew up, I wasn't wanted. I mean, my my parents didn't want me in the house. My parents didn't want me. Period. I don't know why they didn't just give us up. They had a chance with the judges when the judges all got involved because they were brought up on child abuse charges. But they had a chance to let us go. But this whole existence of my life was that I was not wanted and that I was not really worthy. I didn't belong here and that I should just kill myself or I should just die. This was how we grew up. So I carried that with me into my adulthood and nobody really would have known because I didn't tell anybody. I didn't talk about it. I didn't tell people at work that I was going to kill myself. Um, but I would go home at night and I would sit on the couch and I would think, I'm in so much pain. How can I do this? You know. So I know what it's like to be at the point of you know, where's the relief? Where's the where's the where is the place where I can go and when is it gonna be my time? You know, that I that I won't be in this pain, you know, because that pain is very real. And a lot of and people say, Well, how could child be be so bad? It's like get over it. I've had people tell me that before. Get over it. And to me I just look at them and I'm like, you know what, just pray and hope and pray that you don't ever have to experience something so horrible that would make, that, that would cause you such deep, severe pain that you can't find a way out. You know? Because there are so many people on this planet that have experienced that. And it's a horrible place. And so, you know, it's it's too easy to give up. That's why two of my brothers killed themselves. It's just like... Oh, well, no big deal. One of my brothers committed suicide. The other one died of a drug overdose. But he had been he'd been doing so many drugs his whole life, he knew they were going to kill him at some point. And so he's always ending up with drug overdoses in the hospital and stuff and comas and stuff. So he knew. It was just a matter of time. It was like a, you know, a, a, like like an expiry date. And so he knew what he was doing. And so I say that that's not an option. Not an option at all. Suicide is not the answer. And for me, because I'm still here today and approaching my 48th birthday, it's a slap in my parents' face. I mean, not that I want to slap my parents' face, but what it is, it's like, it's like, ha ha, I'm alive. I'm doing good. I actually, hey, I don't have much money. I don't even have a job right now. Um, you know what? But I'm here. You couldn't kill me. And to me, I get the last laugh because I'm still here. So that's what you have to do. You have to stick around and you have to get the help that you need, whatever it may be. Like I'm interested in, I've talked to quite a few counselors. I didn't. I never had any um, any um, particular counseling, but I have talked to quite a few counselors and I've taken uh, biblical counseling and just looked at all kinds of counseling materials, secular and biblical, over the last six years. And a lot of it. And, I mean, if we need to see a counselor, we do. There's no harm in that. There are good people out there. And if you find one that that doesn't work for you, well, then you just keep looking for one that does because it's your right. You have to become your own best advocate. You have a right to find the best best people to help you out, right? We Just like I do, right? I mean, just like my husband who's terminally ill, I have the right to seek the best medicine and the best uh, care for him. Right, it's my right, and it's his right. So you have a right to seek the best care, and so you know if you find someone that you know a therapist or counselor that's not working for you, that's okay. Get someone else who will and who does and who understands your situation and wants to help you out. And it's the same with friends. You know, all my so-called friends, who I thought were friends, are not in my life, but that's okay because the real friends that are in my life are there because they are my real friends, and those are the ones that I that. I, I'm so thankful for and so grateful for, because that's that's the that's 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 the real friends. So you know it, it, it's hard and it's uh, it's some days are harder than others that's for sure. But I would say just keep going, just keep uh, keep carrying on until you find that peace, until you find that place that you say wake up one day and say wow I feel I feel better. I mean I actually feel a little bit better today. It's not so painful, you know. And I just hope and pray that every day it gets a little bit better, right? God bless you all. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.